precious. Nobody. Nobody ever complained at all until we came here on Monday. And even then, the complaint was a number. <coughs> the petitioner, the petitioners appeared before my Lord Judge Ogola on the 16th of October. Orders were made in their favor. They were extremely happy. No complaint. The three judges of this bench were in the bench in 522 of 2024. No complaint. This complaint is a complaint founded on the fact that on the 18th, the Honorable the Attorney General for the first time also got orders. Now that is when this bench became a bad bench. It was a very good bench for as long as it gave any order to the petitioner. It became a suspicious bench when it gave an order, only an order to expedite the hearing. The Attorney General had wanted many things they were all declined. I will address you, my lords, on the understanding that we have two petitions. I will, there's one petition I call the Kirugoya petition. And there is another petition I will call the Nairobi petition. It is our preliminary submission that yesterday's ruling of the 23rd substantially addresses the issues raised in the Kirogoya petition. And that those issues are now, they are estimated. There is issue a stop. There is issue a stop a doctrine of law that states a question that has been resolved by the court cannot be litigated afresh in the same proceedings. It is our second submission that the second, the first limb of the Nairobi petition on recusal that speaks to how the case was handled between the 18th and the 22nd is also <coughs> substantially settled by yesterday's ruling. And I think my learned friend, most of them, were able to confirm that. And they complained about that. No. So what issue is alive? The only issue that is alive is the issue of recusal, allegedly on the grounds that I'm so happy that uh, my, my lady has been spared any further unwarranted uh, attack as regarding her, her standing. So I will, I will not make any reference to that. It has been considered that it was made recklessly without any factual basis. And I think that what a, 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 an ethical advocate of the Honorable Court should do is to start by saying, I apologize to her leadership for these allegations that are contained in a document that bears my signature. But that is not for me to say. So let us proceed to the two other allegations. At one point, I was very surprised to hear a submission that said that my Lord Justice Ogona is close to his wife. <laughs> how, how can that be? How can that possibly be a bad thing? Recently <laughs> married. But a further extension of that argument was equally spurious. A professional person, a professional person is, is, is entitled 
to an independent professional existence. Be it the husband, be it the wife, be it siblings, be it children, they have independent professional. And I am shocked that that can be a ground. Another ground now made is that the Honorable Justice Murima is a friend of the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House was my student. I don't know whether I should refuse myself. But if I may say this with respect, I have been a law teacher for 38 years. I apologize that that's not very long. There are three quarters of the lawyers under the age of 50 I have taught them. I don't know whether I should accuse myself each time I appear against, including the Honorable Trauma Gender here, Senator. Mm -hmm. Do you confirm that? I confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Dr. Rogaro, Senator, the Solicitor General, the Attorney General. This is the nature of our profession. This is the nature of our profession. The speaker is a member of the legal profession. The Honorable Justice Murima is a member of the legal profession. How else are we to do our work? Paul Kibugi Mwete, senior counsel, a personal friend for many years. On the day I got married, he brought me uh, a copper uh, coffee uh, dispenser. Am I never to do any case with him? Should I always tell people? I know Paul Moita from when I was a man. He came to my wedding, he brought me a gift. It cannot possibly be. That is not how this profession works. Let me very quickly say this, uh, what I believe, we believe, is the standard. The standard is set in the case of uh, most important of this all, is the right case which has been talked about. When will you ask for an accusal? And I agree with uh, I agree with Dr. Camino when he says that no lawyer, no advocate, should ever, ever make an application for accusal lightly. Indeed, an advocate approached by a client who is making personal attacks against a judge that are baseless must return the brief to the client. That is the honorable thing to do. Uh, I have referred you to the right case, uh, but the most important of this all is the objective <coughs> test that is set in the Rawal case. In the Rawal case, which you are aware of, Rawal versus Judicial Service Commission, the court says, there is no basis for a judge to automatically recuse themselves when a bare allegation is made by a party. The allegation must be substantiated. First, they now quote the quote of a people. Firstly, it is obvious from the above test that there is no basis for the latter elastic test propounded by Dr. Camino, where a judge must automatically recuse himself or herself upon the making of a bare allegation of any of the parties. We have not come across any authority in support of the proposition, and Dr. John Kamenoa did not provide any. On the contrary, decisions are bound that judges must not recuse themselves on flimsy and baseless allegations. It is our submission that a claim that the friendship that may exist between a party and a judge because they went to the same school, because they went to the same university, because they come from the same county, that is baseless. It must be demonstrated. Like was said in the case of Capron and Stratton versus Z Engineering Construction Limited. If disqualifications issues were to be raised, say, because a judge and a member of the bar belong to the same Rotary Club or the same Lions Club, 
or the same sports club, there would be no end to such approaches. There would be no end. In this case, it has not been demonstrated that there is any way in which the independence of any of the judges here can be said to have been compromised. something relating to the Dari case, because I was involved in that case, again with my very good friend, the Honorable P.K. Moite, on one side, and uh, my friend Paul Nyamodi, they were on one side, I was on the other side. I think that's why Mr. Mr. Nyamodi has now come back to my side, <laughs> because we were, we were the successful party in that case. And as one of my learned juniors, here on the opposite side has stated, you need to understand the context of the Larry case. Because at paragraph 24, the court states this, their parents' applicants hearing are seeking a stay order, are seeking a stay order from this court in the most unusual, strange, and dare we say, disingenuous strategy. What have they done, my learned friends? We had litigated for a very long time. Litigated in England in the High Court, litigated in England in the Court of Appeal, litigated in the High Court here, litigated in the Court of Appeal here, litigated in the Supreme Court. And their final card, they had made a complaint against the Supreme Court. And what they were asking the Supreme Court to do is stay proceedings as we go to prosecute the allegations we made against you. And I think the Supreme Court threw the sink at them. Uh, and that is why the, de the decision is, says what it says. Now, I want to wind up by saying that if, if this court were to accede to this application, it would throw into disarray a critical public interest <coughs> litigation when the country is in the throes of a serious constitutional crisis. That is why philosophers like Dr. Muthoni say that cities burn, cities burn as philosophers are quibbling on whether we need a bucket or a pipe to put out the fire. We are in the throes of a grave constitutional crisis. The court that we have been given to resolve this issue cannot stop sitting on the basis of the most flimsy allegations of friendship between parties. Because I don't know of a single <coughs> representation here that is not related to one another. If this, if you open this door, you will have created a precedent where all a lawyer needs to do, an advocate, all he needs to do is to make a connection. To make a connection. You go to the same church. You go to the same mosque. You used to work in the same chambers. You are trained by the same pupil master. Our connections will never see. Like they say about taught actions. There can never be an end to taught actions and there can never be an end to the relationships we have in the legal profession. We, an applicant must demonstrate that because of that relationship, there is reason to believe 
demonstrated by later past behavior, past judgment, past ruling, past conduct, that a judge will be biased in any way. But ultimately, as the authorities I have cited to you state, a judge has taken a judicial oath. A judge has a judicial oath. He answers to his conscience and to his oath. Now, finally, I will say, because I've had the great privilege to sit as an arbitrator in numerous matters, both locally and overseas, I, I have never found a standard that requires that if that a person who has a historical connection with somebody without demonstrating more than that can be the basis of the case. I will now hand over before Madam thank you for asking me to to my learned friend, Mr. Bo. My lords and my ladies, uh, for completeness of our record, we have filed grounds of opposition. We also have filed a list and bundle of authorities, all dated the 22nd of October 2024. My lords and my ladies, Permit me to start by saying that judges, just like any other judicial officer, have a duty to sit. They sit to determine disputes. Disputes between parties who come before them. That is what makes us a country governed by the rule of law. In that duty, my lords and ladies, it is important that we ensure there is efficiency in the conduct of that very important responsibility. That is on the one hand. On the other hand, it is important that judges then guard against manipulation of processes. In the context of what we have proceedings like we have today, the manipulation of process could manifest itself in the form of forum shopping, where we say that I will file this matter before this court, before this court, and before this court. In my book, one of them will give. And that if I run into headwinds, in any particular direction, then I must, as of necessity, run away from that court. My Lord and my Lady, this is a position that has been adjudicated, the fact that the court has a duty to sit, all the way to our Supreme Court. We have in our list and bundle of authorities provided, I've cited one of the cases of the, being the case of Gladys Beaucholet versus the Judicial Service Commission, a second party. At paragraph 5 of that decision, the court says that the doctrine of duty of a judge to see it, though not profound in Kenya's jurisdiction, then there's a thing that's very mistake. Every judge has a duty to sit in a matter which they should duly sit in. The recusal should not be used to cripple a judge from sitting or to hear a matter. That duty to sit was buttressed by the fact that every judge took an oath of office to serve impartially and protect, administer, and defend the Constitution. In yet another decision, Peter Mwangi Gishuru versus the Attorney General and uh, the Salaries and Remuneration Commission, at paragraph 61 of that decision, the court says, the court has a duty to sit on matters presented before it 
for resolution and should only recuse itself where circumstances permit, but not where it will create an unconstitutional moment by refusing to hear a litigant's case because the opposite party apprehends bias. In what context then should we understand that uh, jurisprudence? It must not be lost on us that when we are dealing with momentous topical issues of conversation in a country such as Kenya, like what we are dealing with, these matters evoke emotions. Just like in our election context, whenever a party loses, it is never so easy to accept the result of that loss. It is for that reason that sometimes people have all manner of uh, aspersions cast against the court, against the independent, uh, other, let's call it all other independent organs of the constitution, because a decision has gone one way or the other in instances not favorable to one party and favorable to another. We must appreciate that we are in an adversarial system where, as of necessity, a decision will be determined or will be made in, one, in favor of one party as against the other. That saying, my lords and lady, Learned Senior Council Professor Gilu Migai has made reference to the fact that the matter that is before you, though dubbed as recusal, is a matter whose subject matter has been completely determined. There is issue based on that, and that everything that has been presented before you today are issues that were contained in the ruling that your lordship issued yesterday. As a starting point, I would make reference, my lords and lady, to the application that was filed yesterday by our opponents. The application seeking to have this, the question is the empanelment of this bench. If you look at paragraph Y, of that application, on the, great, uh, the, the, the grounds on the face of the application. My lords, my lady, the court was invited particularly to recuse itself. It then means that that motion for recusal was a motion that was live before this court. That motion was live between the same parties. It touched on the same issues that were presented before this court. The court pronounced itself on those on all those issues. What then is the business of bringing those issues through this second court application in the name of an application for recusal? My lords and my lady, if at all, as we now see, the applicants were not satisfied with that decision, the ruling of this court, the option that was available for them was to appeal that. Presenting this second uh, uh, application does not in any way open for them a door other than for purposes of delaying these proceedings. And I would say that with tremendous respect to my uh, learned friends on the other side, and so that I am able to demonstrate, permit me to just look at the applications that have been filed and the issues that have been raised in those applications. <coughs> I'll start with the application filed by my good friend, Dr. Evans Ogara. In his application, dated the 21st of October, 2024, he raises as ground number one, the issues of the certification of these matters. On the 18th of October, that was an issue that was before you yesterday. At paragraph three, so that we understand context. He also says that on the next day, being Saturday, 19th October 24, 2024, the petitioners were surprised by the turn of events wherein they were served with an order of this honorable bench, stating that the first and sixth respondents application dated 18th October 2024 was coming up for interparties here. Again, that was an issue that was before you. At paragraph four, he talks about 
the subsequent reference of the matter by the Chief Justice uh, on the 18th, uh, to the Chief Justice on the 18th of October. That was an issue that was before you. Finally, he questions the unclear circumstances that led to the placement of the file of this bench on a Saturday uh, before you without the express directions of the Chief Justice. Again, my lord and my lady, that was a matter that was before you. In the application by uh, Mr. Njiru uh, Negwa, again, the same thing. First round, that the petitioners have learned that this bench sat on a Saturday, the 19th of October 2024. That was an issue that was before you. Paragraph 2 it says that the petitioners were surprised by the sudden turn of events. Again, the same language used by the application in the application, a matter that was before you. Paragraph 6 it says that the petitioners are apprehensive that this sort of report has clearly demonstrated that the case for the Attorney General is more important than our, than our petitions, yet they are raising similar issues. Again, that issue was before you and it was determined. Paragraph 8. Let me stop first. How then do we treat all those issues that were before you? And if we are, just so that then we understand that these matters are before you, when you delivered your ruling, which was shared with us this afternoon, from paragraph 70, 73, all the way to paragraph 96, each and every of these issues were uh, responded to. I mean, determinations were made. At paragraph 79, for instance, the court says, but backed by this sequence of events, we take great exception to the petitioner's conduct that when favorable to the petitioners, orders issued outside the normal working hours of the court raise no concern. However, when the same court acts in an instance where it has been properly moved by the other parties and likewise proceeds to deal with an application at hand in the same vein, the petitioners show their indignation. That was the finding that was made. At paragraph 96, we even go further to say that one of the senior counsels went further by intimating that an exercise akin to the radical surgery may be forthcoming, a statement which we perceive as a vague attempt at intimidating, uh, 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 at, at, at intimidation coming from senior counsel. My lords and my ladies, what is left that you're supposed to be tackling again? It is an attempt to have a second bite at that which has already said. If for one moment we were to look at uh, this application by Mr. Ndekwajiru, uh, he then introduces very strange allegations, allegations which he has had to draw. Maybe we saw his discomfort at making reference to those issues. But as you, 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 you probably all observe, these issues around making allegations and running away from them are meant to have as passions and indirectly intimidate the court. Permit me to say, or to make reference to paragraph 8, where they say, for instance, that uh, the petitioners have credible information that Honorable Justice Brehman is a close associate to the proposed deputy president, uh, uh, one Mr. Kidure Kidiki, and that the said that failed, refused, and or neglected to disclose that fact. Really, is that an issue that a party seeking the resolution of a matter that they brought under a certificate of urgency would want to raise to be a reason for a judge to disqualify himself? What is this association that we're talking about? What evidence have we tendered that, that there is anything that will be considered to be either untoward or that will make it inappropriate for uh, the judge to sit in this uh, proceeding? In fact, they go on to add in a paragraph that they saw to uh, one of paragraphs, uh, paragraph 10, they say that this close association between Honorable Justice Dreamer and the proposed nominee for the position of uh, Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya might have caused this court to convene and sit on a Saturday with a view of assisting one party in this proceedings. Is that not outrageous to say the least? We go on to say, at paragraph 11, 
that the petitioners are in possession of credible information that Mr. Justice Ogola, who is the presiding judge in this proceedings, is conflicted as his spouse is a member of the Kenya Watch Board, having been appointed by the President of the Republic of Kenya, who has in case nominated Mr. Kigure Kibiki as his principal assistant. Allow me to pause on that allegation for one moment. What evidence do they present? Absolutely none. Today, let me take one step back. Yesterday, when the court was rising, we did put them on notice that we would seek to cross-examine the deponents of the affidavits that contain these uh, very uh, uh, unfortunate affirmations. To try and cure that, they then introduced a gazette notice. In that gazette notice, my lords and my lady, they then seek to say, gazette notices speak for themselves. The Gazette Notice says, that is Gazette Notice number 7515, in the exercise of powers conferred by those provisions of the law, I appoint Rose Ombaki and Florence Auma Oloj to be members of the Kenya Water Towers Agency Board for a period of three years with effect from 9th of June 2023. The appointments by uh, Gazette Notice number this and this are thereby revoked. That Gazette Notice is signed by the Cabinet Secretary for Environment and Climate Change and Forestry, Soipan Tuya. At what point, my lords and my lady, does then, at what point does it become that it is His Excellency the President who appointed uh, <coughs> I have to use the words. <clears throat> His spouse is a member of the Kenya Water Towers Board, having been appointed by the President of the Republic of Kenya. When we come with such outright lies, what are we trying to do to the court, to the individual members of the court, to the parties before these proceedings? <clears throat> Is it a case of saying that you will get out of that court by all means necessary, including by handling lies? My lords and my lady, these are the grounds upon which you're being asked to recuse yourselves. I've also seen there was, um, just in one second, there was a very uh, equally strange a vermint about Lady Justice uh, Freda Mugabe. Lady Justice Mugabe is conflicted as such as she could. There is an abandonment to the effect that Lady Justice Frida Mugambi was a student oh. Yes, yes, yes. That Lady Justice Gabi is conflicted as such she could refuse herself as she was Mr. Kiduri Kendiki's LLM student at Moi University, a crucial issue that she failed, refused, and or failed to disclose to the parties at the inception of the trade of the trial. My lords and my lady, the qualifications of our judges are not simple because they're state officers. You only need to go to the website. Judicial Service Commission, and you find the truth. I thought, my lady, when we saw this very strange apartment, we took the trouble to go to the website of the Judicial Service Commission and established that her ladyship, Justice Wilfrida Mugambi, got her LLM from Birmingham University in the UK. How then 
do we want to bring these lies and feed them to the people of Kenya, feed them to the court, and expect that on account of such flimsy, concocted material, then the court should, uh, should, should uh, uh, recuse itself. Again, is it a case of us saying, by all means necessary, we shall not appear before that court? My lord, my lady, there are clear standards and thresholds that have been established both by the regulations governing the conduct of the court and even case law. That, my lord and my lady, first you exercise your conscience as to what should make you recuse yourself. Number two, in the event that a party is raising a concern as to your recusal, then it must be a substantial issue. It must be a substantial question that has been brought before you. It cannot be that every frivolous allegation that is meant, that is brought before the court, should make the court down its tools. That, my lord and my lady, will amount or will create or facilitate an environment where foreign, foreign shopping would be right. We just need to mention anything that I went to school with so-and-so, that I go to church with so-and-so, that I travel with so-and-so, and that should be a reason for them to accuse themselves. That certainly cannot be the standard. But also, my lady, I will refer you to one of the decisions in our Bangladesh list authorities, that's uh, the uh, UNAD, Expert CJL 1986, uh, 60 AL, J, uh, JR 528, where the court had this to say, that although it is important that justice must be seen to be done, it is equally important that judicial officers discharge their duty and do not, by acceding too readily to suggestions and appearances of bias, encourage parties to believe that by seeking the disqualification of a judge, they will have their case tried by someone thought to be more likely to, to decide the case in their favor. My lords, my lady, the question that we'll be asking ourselves is what is that fundamental question that has been presented? And why this is an important concern is because sometimes such frivolous grounds are raised purely to embarrass the court. On this occasion, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that the net effect of what these allegations have done is an attempt at embarrassing the court. My lords and my lady, we urge that you resist that impact. You resist that temptation to ask the court to recuse itself on the basis of such flimsy, baseless allegations. Um, just for that, speak to the fact that this is an attempt at embarrassing, if not intimidating the court. Our friends for the applicant have also indicated that they have simultaneously sent or lodged a complaint with the Judicial Service Commission. Following from the submissions that I made reference to in the ruling about intimidating the court with radical surgery, again, going to the question of presenting this application for recusal after the one yesterday, and now going to lodge a complaint to the Judicial Service Commission, is that not an attempt at intimidating the court? My lords and my lady, I would not ask for an answer. That is an issue that anybody, any reasonable person out there would be able to make a determination or a determination about in their own uh, uh, space. My lords and my lady, is it also possible that this could be one of those issues that the, the, the applicants, or rather the respondents, have complained of as being related. Because we raised concerns yesterday. We are raising them again today. We have spent a whole afternoon arguing about issues that on the one hand are, are being completely determined by this court. The second part of those issues are issues that do not have any grounding, any material, or in support whatsoever. Are those not meant to delay these proceedings by any, uh, by any, uh, by any means necessary. Having taken cognizance of the fact that we came to you, both parties, under certificate of urgency, 
these matters must be treated with the agents with which we came. And so we ask, my Lord and my Lady, that you dismiss that application with the content that it serves. May I now invite my uh, learned friend, Mr. Yamoni, to speak to a few of the main issues? My Lord, my lady, I wish to commence my submission in opposition to the application for refusal for you this evening by tendering an unreserved apology on behalf of the members of the bar who have been urging and opposing the application before you today. Despite my relatively few years of the bar, I appreciate that prosecuting an application for recusal, and I have some experience in prosecuting applications for recusal, and it will become apparent in a moment, are not easy applications to prosecute. But the reason that I offer the unreserved opponent is that it is my humble and respectful position that however difficult they are, there is no need for them to be prosecuted in as bad natured a manner as these applications have been prosecuted before. And for that, I am sorry. The only mistake that your lordships and my lady have made is to serve your nation as judges of the High Court and choose to sit in this matter. We have been told that there is no difference between this matter and any other matter, and I affirm that there is no difference. It is a matter just like any other matter. I wish to start by perhaps completing a submission that was made and not completed by my learned colleague, Mr. Bumbo, who submitted a few moments before. The issue of your recusal was not just an issue in the grounds, in the, in the, in the, in the notice of motion that you determined yesterday, but it was contained in prayer five in that notice of motion. And I do not understand why the petitioners complain of bias or any uh, uh, improper treatment by this court. Because again, in my few years at the bar, in my relatively few years at the bar, seldom have I come across an application dated today, had on the same day, and a, and a, and a substantive ruling running to in excess of 40 pages delivered the next day. So that issue has been dealt with conclusively by the court in yesterday's ruling. I wish to uh, then focus on the authority that was cited in the Dali matter. And again, in my relatively few years at the bar, I have had the uh, pleasure, the privilege of arguing several matters in the Supreme Court. Many of them are precedent setting. Dari is one of them, and I did not know Dari would be one of them. But the ruling of the Supreme Court delivered in the Dari matter on the 11th of October this year has confounded me for a few years. Uh, I am still trying to understand what the meaning of that decision is. And I will share with your lordships some of my, you know, some of the issues I have with that decision. And hopefully with your ruling you will help me understand. The decision in Dari is not available as an authority for what the petitioners cite it to be. And one of the issues that confound me with that daily decision, and if my lord, my lady, when you retire to uh, uh, consider your ruling in this matter, you take a moment and find the original script or the original version, not the one reported in KRA, but the one that is on the Supreme Court's website and was circulated to us on the 11th of this month, you will find that at the beginning of that ruling, Paul Yamodi, U.S. truly, is referred to as senior counsel. <laughs> now, I cannot insist that I'm senior counsel because the Supreme Court referred to me as senior counsel in that ruling. That is the first issue that confounded me with that ruling. The second issue is that there was no application for the learned judges of the Supreme Court to recuse themselves. 
there being no application for the learned judges of the Supreme Court to accuse themselves, learned judges of the Supreme Court did not then have the benefit